everyone, welcome once again to Gotham Discussions. I am Captain Logan. And I'm Steve Baxter. Today we're going to talk about the second episode of Gotham, Selena Kyle. And before that happens, we're going to go through a couple of comments from last week on the first episode. Uh, as you can see, we do not have Dan's news with us tonight. Uh, he had something that came up at the very last minute, but, or not the very last minute, like the second to last minute, because in, in the very last minute, he took the time to record his comments. So he's actually going to appear on the show, uh, but he will be pre-recorded. So we're going to respond to his comments and things. And uh, he gave us an introduction, Steve. Oh, cool. And let's uh, take a look first at his introduction. Hey, guys. Sorry I couldn't be there uh, this week, uh, but I'm representing the Geek Volution shirt. Yeah. <laughs> now available on the Geek Volution spread shirt. Also, <laughs> why I, I, I made the logo. So He, he did. Double he link. The logo. The logo. The logo. <laughs> that was my intro. So, hey. Okay, so uh, there, there is Dan. He's with us in spirit and also in pre-recorded video. Uh, he will be talking with us uh, a little bit later, uh, giving us his uh, favorite things, his least favorite things, and he'll weigh in on, on all the major categories at the end. Steve, are you ready to get rolling? Yep, I'm good. It's good to see you. Let's get going. Uh, so, first of all, let's go through a few comments. Um, the first one I wanted to mention was uh, FrenchStick1 uh, just just uh, yesterday said, Hey, Cap, I was wondering if you could weigh in on the possibility of seeing the Flying Graysons making it appear at some time in the future. Is that something you would be interested in seeing? I guess right off, and I feel like this with other things in the show that they're already doing, I guess, but right off, Steve, I can't really imagine what the point of that would be because Dick Grayson wouldn't be born yet, you would figure. So it would be like maybe maybe his parents or like one of them as a kid or something. Because otherwise you'd make them like the same age or even Dick would be older. Like how could you even, how could you even do it? Um, yeah, I mean, there's so many people have been asking me about like, can we see a Robin in this show? I'm like, sure, but they'd be their parent, but like 12 years old. But I'm not sure if anyone wants to see that. Like I don't want to see Dick Grayson's mom or dad as 12 year olds. They're not interesting yet. I think, I'm sure maybe you can give him a cool backstory, but what's the point? You could do, like, maybe an episode or even, like, an appearance or, or, or something. You know what I mean? Like, like, like just, right. just kind of make a nod to it or something. Or even, I wouldn't mind seeing, like, a Haley Circus truck passing by yeah. or something like that. But I don't think they should do, like, a full tilt, let's do, let, let's make them a regular character or something. You know, now that you, uh, now that we mentioned this, I think a great idea for a villain in this show would be Clue Master. What if we saw Clue Master as a kid with his parents, and then with the background of how we know Stephanie Brown is and what her relationship is to Clue Master, we can get a little bit of like influence on that. Maybe we see like he has an abusive dad or something. That's a great idea. I, I don't know if I could trust the show to think to do that because I think it's a lot more likely that we will get more characters that really should be Bruce Wayne's age or younger that end up being older than him way early. Uh, like right <laughs> I think I think that's. See, I'm fine with that one. You know, there, there's 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 different things. But again, I guess, I guess we'll see. I am really happy. We'll talk about this later. I am really happy that Catwoman has turned out to be pr practically his age. I thought she was three, four years older. Uh, she is a year older or just months older, and I didn't know that until watching this episode. So that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad that they've kept those two in the same group at the very least. Uh, okay. Do you have a do you have a comment you want to you want to comment on? Uh, yes, yes, I do. Go um, ahead. There's one that I had a back and forth with on before, and it's a long comment, so I'm not going to read the whole thing. But essentially, it's from Jamie and his ego, and I love that name, by the way. Um, <laughs> and he made a he made a reference because he's a political philosophy grad, and he mentioned some misconceptions about um, converting some of this nerdy stuff into political philosophy. And uh, he, he made this notion that um, there, there's a whole bunch of misconceptions when it comes to Hobbes and chaos. And he made a really good point about that, because when we talked about the show and I mentioned kind of Hobbes offhandedly, I didn't give it any context. But um, essentially, he's just pointing out the fact that Hobbes doesn't mean that government is chaos or anything like that. Hobbes just means that people without government are in a natural state of war. And I'm really glad that he pointed that out. He also pointed out some connections between Batman and Kant, because Kant's a deontologist and Batman's a deontologist. And that could be really fascinating down the line. But yeah, uh, just go and read both of his long comments because they're really insightful, and I wish I had the whole time to talk about them. Uh, yeah, I, I, I read I, I read a little bit of that and thought it was really cool that uh, somebody um, you know on that level of, of, of thinking about philosophy was taking a look at our show. And uh, you know, you know, Steve, I just I can't believe it. I, um, <laughs> Steve, Steve, I'm thinking about starting a second channel called Captain Logan and His Id. What do you What do you think? <laughs> 
maybe. Uh, Zach at UTA, I was thinking that it would have been better for Cobblepot to not be called Penguin until after he had his leg jacked up by Fish Mooney. Then have someone <laughs> slightly say in a later episode, hey, you know, when you walk, you look like a penguin, as opposed to just saying, hey, his nickname is Penguin, because, well, you know why. Also, that he hates it at first because of what happened to him. I think it would make for better character evolution if that was the case. What do you think, Mr. Logan? Uh, <laughs> you can call the gap, then it's cool. Um, I, 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 I like that idea a lot. I, obviously, as I always say, you can't rewrite the show. This is the show they're making. This is the way they're doing it. So, you know, we're, 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 we're stuck with it. And so you, you, you want to you wanna see them do what they're doing in the best possible way they can do it. Having said that, um, I understand people's qualms with everybody's calling him, a, a, it says he looks like a penguin, but how much like a penguin does he really look? It's almost like we're projecting 75 years of this character, because he's about as old as Batman, isn't he? We're, we're, right. we're, uh, we're kind of projecting, you know, we're, we're, okay, when we see a, when we see a, I almost said balloon, when, when, when we see a uh, umbrella, we think penguin, we, we, you, know, you know what I mean? When we see a long nose, we think, but how much of a penguin does he really look? And I don't even, I don't know, maybe I just haven't noticed his walk. People keep saying he's waddling like a penguin, but I don't feel like we've actually gotten to watch him walk all that much, so... I don't yeah. know. Um, I, I can see where he's coming from. It, it could be handled in a more sophisticated way. What we're getting is kind of TV. It's not bad for TV. Yeah, um, I can see the water. I can see why someone will want the nickname to come later. But I also think he does kind of already look like a penguin because he's got the nose and the hair and the suit. and It's a little on the nose, but it's not bothering me so much. It's, not, it's a lot of this is not as on the nose as I thought maybe it would be, and some of it when it, it is, and they have made me on board with it. Like like Selena Kyle calling herself Cat, like well before the whole Catwoman thing, I'm fine with it. it like it's working. I, I have no I have no problem with that. Um, you, um, you, you I guess we'll disagree on that a little bit later. <laughs> okay, we'll talk about it later. That's cool. Well, well, I mean, I just I haven't felt like I've had cause to have a problem with it yet. Like, okay. <laughs> um, um, yes. Do you have uh, another, Do you have another comment? Yes, uh, this one's addressed to you, but I'll read it. It says, uh, hey, Cap, I've had an idea about Gotham for a while now that I'd love to hear your thoughts on. Court of Owls. I think that Falcone gang will be here in the forefront for more than a few seasons. The court seemed like just a secret society of killers to keep the show going. Maybe not until season three, but then all throughout the earlier season, we can get little hints to owl references, and that's from Ultron 32. Uh, I would bet money that we get court owls in the show. Uh, that would not even remotely surprise me, especially uh, because of, and I don't like to talk too much about trailer material and stuff, so we won't we won't talk too much about this, Steve, but uh, but uh, there, there is a uh, trailer that came out that has made it pretty obvious that they're going to do Arkham City and, yes. some, and, and some other things like that, and so they're, they are clearly going to really recent source material, really recent source material, and uh, it's sort of like I'm thinking, Steve, it's going to be a little bit like uh, X-Men, the the animated series in the 90s, where they go to, like, whatever was big in the last five years. Uh, I, I, like, so, uh, Court of the Owls, that was, like, the huge, huge thing that put uh, uh, Snyder on the map. Yeah, I, I, I think I, I would not be surprised about that at all. One thing I was surprised about, um, I'll bring this up now, because I'm not sure it'll come up later. Um, I was surprised... Of course, we might find out this is this is not the case, but it seems like at first glance that the cobble pots in this immigrated only like a generation ago. Yeah, Where, it seems a little bit like that with his, with the way his mother acts in this episode. Because, of, because she's got that really thick accent and everything, she she would have to be an immigrant to have that. I would figure to have that thick of an accent. And uh, and by the way, I could not place it. I was like, is she Greek? Is she Russian? What is she? Uh, maybe yeah, I'm I just maybe I'm just terrible at that. I, clearly, I am because far far <laughs> too often do I do I say uh, that person has an Australian accent and somebody goes, no, they're a Brit. Cap, what are you talking about? <laughs> but uh, I'm thinking uh, I'm thinking that I. Either uh, they've changed that where the Cobblepots in this version are not founders of Gotham like they are with Snyder and like 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 they are in, in, in other things, um, or or she's not exactly his mother because uh, she pronounces the name differently. And at first I thought, oh, she's just pronouncing it weird, and that's that's how they pronounced it over there. IMDb has it listed. And I don't know if we can take any stock on that in this, but IMDb, IMDb has it listed where her name is phonetically couple put with a K and a P U T at the end, but then Oswald is still Oswald Cobblepot. I, I, I don't I don't know what to make of that. That's interesting. I didn't see that. Um, I mean, I, I was figuring like you thought, like maybe they're just changing for the sake of change, like Falcone. 
but yeah, uh, yeah. But how do you get really strange? You, you look at the way it's spelled. How do you get put at a pot? It's pot, it's cobble <laughs> pie. It doesn't matter how. Like like I can't think of any language in which an O is pronounced that way. Is that a thing? Like so I don't know. Um, I don't know if that was, was just doing it to sound cooler or something. I don't know. I don't know if that was just a, if that was a mistake on on the part of IMDb. I don't want to. I don't want to be like the internet said it so it's right. But I want I wonder about it. If that was in the script, then there's a thing there. Uh, let's see. Is there is there anything else that we want to talk about real quick? before we move on. Um, oh, oh, yes, uh, Senior Nerd, I guess you didn't catch this, but the apartment where Jim and Barbara live is a clock tower. Huh. Cool! Is it I really? Didn't know that. I, I thought it was just a Skyrise apartment. Is it actually a clock tower? That's really super cool if it is. Um, what do we have to pay to live in a clock tower in a New York-style city? Ah, that's a good question. Yeah, and on a cop that's salary. Awesome. And on a cop salary, too. Yeah, uh, I mean, supposedly Barbara in this universe comes from money, so maybe that's what it is, but it's still really cool to have a clock tower house. Also, when Cobblepot eats the guy's sandwich, I love that scene, uh, the, the, the way the way he just stuffs it in his mouth reminds me how Danny DeVito Penguin would uh, slobber on fish in Batman Returns. Yeah, yeah, I can kind of see yeah. that. Um, there's definitely a mix of different... Uh, versions of things um, all going into that character, and uh, I think it's a I, so far. I think it's a brilliant mix. Penguin is probably the character I'm most interested in right now. Um, I'm I'm, re yeah. I'm really impressed with his characterization, and I think he has the most potential uh, dimension and and you know you know potentially fascinating stuff to to explore. As we yeah, go him on. and Bruce, I just love in this series. Um, he's very clearly a mix of the intelligent penguin with the kind of brutish, terrifying, creepy nightmare fuel penguin from Batman Returns. Yeah. Um, and it, I mentioned Batman Eternal before, and this show just more and more seems like Batman Eternal. Because we get an intelligent <laughs> penguin that degenerates into like an evil killer in that book as well. Steve, let's go ahead and listen to uh, some more of uh, Dan's comments, or, well, to some, some of Dan's comments. So far, all we've, we've heard him say is, uh, hey, I got a Geek Evolution shirt. Um, <laughs> tell your friends. So uh, let's let's go ahead and listen to uh, uh, his overall comments, and then we'll respond to some of those, and we'll offer some of our own. So before I get into my thoughts and such, uh, I just wanted to once again apologize. Sorry I'm not there, um, because... Uh, I, I had a thing tonight that kind of popped up last minute, and I couldn't be there this week. But I'll be there back next week live in person, so yeah. Um, so overall, I, I thought this episode was a, a big improvement, a vast improvement over the first episode. I really liked it a lot more. Um, I connected with things a lot more. The characterization was so much better. Um, it, it just all the way around. It was a lot better. Um, it felt like uh, that things were, it, like, it just started off... It gripped me with, with the two weirdos um, kidnapping the children and stuff like that. Um, I really liked that. It was it had such a cartoony feel to me. This episode had a lot more kind of cartoony looking characters, to me at least. Uh, the first episode was definitely pretty cartoony, but I felt like just uh, the, the two bad guys, the two uh, captor people, um, and the uh, even the guy they, they're turning the children into, uh, turning the children into not he's, he's not they're not turning the children into anything <laughs> but the guy there they're giving them to just he looks very cartoony it just reminds me of Batman the Animated Series a little bit I don't know why um, but I, I liked Gordon and um, Bullock's uh, like back and forth a lot better this time uh, the acting all the way around I thought was a lot better um, Catwoman or Cat now that she's actually finally talking there's a bit more kind of going on with her I think she's really good. Um, I always I always like Catwoman, how she's kind of like so street savvy and stuff like that, and this iteration isn't any different. Like, she's she's smart, she's quick. She might not be as 100% um, finessed at, if that makes sense, um, you know, as Catwoman yet, but she, there, all the elements are there for her to grow into this character. And I think so far, she, her, Gordon, and a little bit of Bruce, like I, 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 those seeds are like connecting directly for me. Um, I still think that I, I, I don't know what it is. The kid's a little shaky for me for who plays Bruce. Um, not horrible, but he borderlines whiny kid. But then at the same time, he's a little kid and his parents just died, so I can kind of see why he's sitting in the corner listening to heavy metal. But um, 
it just it, it, it just seems a little like mm, to me. I don't know. I mean, but that's Batman. Batman's essentially a grown man walking around going mm, so. Um, but uh, yeah, no thing, things all the way around. I think are a lot more developed and are making a clicking a bit more and are going so much more smoothly. Um, it didn't take until the end of the episode, like the first episode, for me to really kind of click and, and go. So I, I really liked uh, all the all the things they did with this episode. Also, the penguin is. Really interesting. I don't like. I'm glad that he gets his own like B story going on because I, he's he's. I'm glad they're focusing him as the kind of main side villain with his own story the entire time going throughout the series seemingly so far. So yeah, interesting and a lot better. Uh, I'm gonna agree that uh, it's a tighter script. Uh, that it's th this does feel a lot more indicative of what they want this show to be going along. I I, I do still understand why folks are saying that it hasn't that, that, that it hasn't quite found its identity yet. Um, and many shows don't in the first couple episodes. I've, you know I've, I've I've seen this happen a lot worse. And boy, do they have a lot of characters and a lot of things to juggle. Um, this this can't be an easy thing to figure to to you know um, to. to to realize, especially if you're not going to just do straight up Batman, that's still kind of my reservation. Is I still can't figure <laughs> out why it can't just be straight up Batman because I feel like with the with, with the production values they have, they could just be doing Batman. I'm not going to agree with uh, with with Dan though on uh, the the kid playing Bruce Wayne. I think he's fine. Yeah, agreed. Um, the kid who plays Bruce Wayne, I think, is one of the best actors in that show. He's great. I want the show to get seven seasons. Just so I can see him put on the costume, he's that good. I, I think he's really good. I, I, I feel like we're seeing quite a bit going on behind his eyes. Um, I think this show, this is a weird thing to say, maybe one of the best things this show has figured out is what to do with child actors. Yeah. Because it doesn't have, it doesn't give them thousands of pages of dialogue when they're not real experienced actors and they're still trying to figure out what what, what they're doing and how to, because I mean, you know, at 13 you're not going to be super um, experienced yet unless you have been acting since you were four and clearly that doesn't really, or at least that doesn't really seem to be the case with these with, with these uh, uh, actors. I haven't looked back into their backgrounds that hard. And um, they, uh, they're, they're, they were really intelligent, uh, especially with Selena Kyle, not to give her any dialogue in that first episode because I felt like I got to see, again, it, it, it seemed like lots of stuff going on behind her eyes, um, getting, uh, uh, her getting to kind of just have, have a feel for the look, and then gradually put the characterization with it, so that when she finally started talking, I wanted so badly to like her already, that, that, uh, that, that I think that helped a lot, but also, uh, she, she and the kid playing Bruce Wayne are both really, you know, you know, decent child actors, but, uh, they're easing us into that, and, uh, boy, it is a huge risk to have two, to have two of your most major characters be child actors like that. Uh, I'm impressed with how they're handling that. Yeah, yeah, totally agreed. Um, Selena Kyle does quite a bit in this episode. And it, and when I first watched it, I'm like, why is this episode named after her? She's only important for the last 15 minutes. But uh, as I watched it again, I realized, well, no, there's influence of her all over the place and it works quite a bit. Um, I like that we're not doing the thing of, let's get a character in there to try and understand Selena, like getting Gordon to like learn her backstory and stuff. She just does things and we're forced to like put the pieces together ourselves and we get that she's a lot smarter than she looks sometimes. Um, she's really clever. She's better at cloaking than even Batman is right now. Um, she's doing full on Batman moves in this in this show. And it, it's strange because last episode she could barely pickpocket people without being caught. But I can, I can definitely see behind her that she's had a lot of time on the streets and she's not a person that's going to be easy to get along with, but she's definitely a three-dimensional character. I thought the street smart thing was was wonderful. Uh, I thought that, that a lot of the most intelligent stuff in the script came from her. And you're right, it is a little bit weird that first episode she didn't seem quite as good at stuff as she is here. But once again, that may be kind of a pilotitis problem where right. like they kind of figured that out and went, wait a minute, this is what we want this character to be. Um, I thought that uh, you, you were talking about the whole stealthy thing, going back to Bruce for a second. Um, I thought it was really kind of kind of a fun nod uh, that that um, that Bruce is already sneaking up on people and that Alfred is complaining about it. Uh, that's that's really that's really funny. Bruce. Like, it's rude to, when Alfred's like it's rude to sneak up on people, and I'm like he's gonna make a career of that. I, like I didn't even think about it until the second time I watched it. And I went, oh wait, that's a Batman thing. That's awesome. 
yeah, he's doing it so well already. He's really blending into the background and popping when he needs to. This kid is really good. Uh, there's just not many other words to put to Now, that. let me ask you a question. Is it too much too early, all the stuff that he's doing with, like, trying to hurt himself? They're not hurting himself, but it, but it, but it is, he's not, like, a wrist slasher or anything, but, but, like, but you know, trying to test himself physically and all that. Like, he's already kind of training early, even before he has any sense of, like, the bat thing. We haven't we haven't heard him openly make a vow or anything. Um, is it is it too early for that? Should should it be more like the Nolan version where it's a while before he even really figures out who the heck he wants to be? I feel like this is a lot more classic comic book. Yeah, I mean, in, in the original story, Bruce makes that promise the night of his parents' death, and that's a little campy now, and they're, they're trying to run with that here. At first, I didn't like it because I felt like he's, well, where is he getting all of these lessons from? But on the other hand, we get that scene in this episode where he's listening to Heaven Metal and he's drawing that disturbing picture. Yeah. Some people think it's like a guardian watching over Gotham. Other people think it's a bat cave. But like putting the frame on there, it's just a bunch of demented imagery. I can't discern much of it. I couldn't either. So I think he's already got a bit of a psychosis going on. Yeah, so, which is cool. So maybe if we're running with that and maybe if we're running with the fact that he saw his parents die, he doesn't know what to make of it, and he's just doing things because he doesn't, he can't figure out what's going on in his head. And we gradually build that up to him making methodology out of it that could work at the same time if this kid becomes batman there's no way gordon would not be able to tell exactly yeah well and, and the, the problem is gordon is going to be so instrumental in what turns him into batman and i'm getting the sense already that so will selena kyle uh mm -hmm. that, that like gordon is going to be a huge it looks like mentor figure for both of these kids or you know you know i almost feel like it's going to be at least what they're setting up is almost like a sibling relationship between them we haven't even had them on screen together yet but like like with gordon uh and alfred alfred with bruce wayne but with gordon as almost like a father figure for the both of them, possibly. Uh, we'll see how much more uh, Selena and, uh, and and Gordon are on screen together and, and how often that happens, but I'm really getting the sense that... I, I just feel like you do that in the second episode, and it's the show kind of telegraphing, uh, uh, this is going to be our status quo. Gordon is a mentor figure for these kids. And also, um, I think that it's not an accident that the second episode is about what Gotham is doing to children. Uh, and I really liked that, uh, that, that idea a lot, that that's the first place we go to. Once again, like I said, I think that the script is a lot tighter, and uh, I like that there are uh, a lot of different stories that all come together um, uh, thematically. Uh, you've got kind of your, your your traditional major A and B story with the kids getting kidnapped uh, and then and then the stuff and then the stuff with Bruce Wayne um, and everything in between and then I guess Penguin's almost like a C story uh, but then with the, with the Penguin uh, with the kid that he uh, kidnaps admittedly kind of out of nowhere um, but but even even that they kind of um, they kind of fit into this um, exploration of what what Gotham is doing to children and uh, obviously uh, Selena and Bruce Wayne are both in there. We're, they're both fighting against that. They're both fighting against that tide. And you see all these other kids that are roped into it and and uh, and and can't help it. And what I really like about that is that Gotham is creating a new generation that's just going to start the cycle all over again and continue to make it worse and worse. I think I think going to kids the second episode was a really really smart idea. I like I like that a lot. Yeah, yeah, I think it's fantastic. Um, and just to juxtapose um, Selena with Bruce for a second, Bruce's solution to helping the kids is like, can I just give them money? Can I just give them money? And Gordon's like, no, you can't. But then, well, can I give them clothes? And Bruce has this really clear intention to help people. Yeah. He just doesn't have the means yet. And then Selena, on the other hand, she has no parents for her whole life. She's just been living on the streets. And the city gave her the skills that she needs to survive. And it's the same skills that Bruce will eventually want. The only difference is that she doesn't have the money to get there, so she ha that the city gives them to him, whereas Bruce is going to have to pick them up on his own. And it feels almost like Selena is what Bruce wants to be, but can't just yet, and Selena is what, is what she wishes she had what Bruce had. Yeah, he's looking can, for his mother the same way Alfred is kind of his father figure. Yeah, and and I I wouldn't have t I wouldn't have thought of that right away, but I think that we're going to see that become clearer and clearer as it goes along because she's already got sort of a pseudo vigilante thing going on. Although I don't even want to call it that. It, she's just on the streets, right? Because um, I think it's important to note 
I don't know. I feel like she's what Bruce wants to be as far as skills go. But right. the intent and motivation is different because and, and like and like that's what if you put them to, if you put them together right now you'd get like teenage Batman, right? Because what you uh, what you're missing with her right now is that drive to help people that Bruce Wayne has because she is very much out for herself right now. She's not dispassionate. She's not not dispassionate. She's not she's not like 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 not compassionate. In, in, entirely, it, she. I, I think that we do here and there kind of see that she sort of cares about the, about, about these kids. But the first thing she does when the kids get kidnapped is run, and she she more than anybody else there would have had the means to stop it. I, I mean, I don't know that she really could have, but um, I could see her with a different kind of background, depending on what she has right now, maybe actually attempting to stop it. If Bruce had been there, he probably would have, assuming that there wasn't somebody holding a gun right to his face. And in the first episode, uh, when she sees Bruce, Bruce's parents being, being uh, about to be murdered, she stands there, watches it, and runs. Uh, there's, a, there's a motif forming there. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um... It's interesting also because they're still not directly giving us anything with her. She, she's she got the running thing. She's got the fact that she's got all these skills and she doesn't know how to utilize them just yet. Um, Important. we're not getting so much to that she's a coward or anything no, like that. No, she's not a coward. She. I, I also think it's important that she's clinging on to hope because she yeah. thinks that her mother is still alive. And uh, I liked that background drop a lot uh, because w because they could have just, in this episode, like they went farther than I would have expected, especially when that character got no dialogue in the first episode. Uh, we see a pendant, and, and, and I wrote down, oh, his, her parents are, are, are killed. And I had, to, I had to scribble that out. Um, <laughs> because then, then later on, uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's kind of throwaway exposition. Position, but we find out that her that her uh, that that, that uh, she thinks her mother is still alive, and who knows uh, if if that's if that's really the case. I also think it's important that as we're setting up uh, Arkham Asylum, uh, we're and, and I think it's really interesting that Arkham was a th two things that Arkham was a thing already that that was that was shut down, and and uh, that the Waynes were going to bring bring back. And secondly, I think this is absolutely fascinating that Bruce Wayne's parents controlled Arkham Asylum. Them. That's that's a thing. That's really interesting because that because that means that that uh because because you know with the Batman that you and I know, Steve, we always we always talk about how um Batman might have a, as much so much of a psychosis that what he does is because he's obsessed that he deserves to be in Arkham as much as the people he puts there. The fact that his parents were the people that ran it, I think, could be a really big in, important um uh, thing for what we do with his uh, personality. Yeah, um, I mean, I might be grasping at straws here, but when Falcone says that when the Waynes died, it put everything out of balance because those were the two pillars of the city, and the Waynes were about to reopen Arkham Asylum, could, is it possible that maybe Bruce's father saw that the city only functions under Falcone, so he opened up Arkham to put all the criminals that are going against him away, just to keep the peace temporarily? Like, is there some kind of, we're, we're trading in the worst evil for the lesser evil right now thing going on there? Yeah, and I mean you're right. We can't we can't know that yet, and and there, there's no there's no evidence to that. But if that's the case, that's really. And I wonder if Arkham again. I'm grasping now. I wonder if Arkham has anything to do at all with why they got killed. Yeah, yeah, really. Let's, um, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, sorry. I, I was just agreeing with your point, but yeah, it, it's it's definitely like that. Um, it, there is that Batman story where Bruce Wayne runs Arkham. Um, it yeah. was an Elseworld story, an Elseworlds thing. and maybe they're taking some influence from that, but I haven't read it in a very long time, so I'm not sure. Uh, let's go ahead and, and, and move on and listen to some more of uh, Dan's comments. Um, he's going to tell us uh, about the stuff that he liked the most. Something I really, really liked about um, the this episode was just uh, the, the... A lot of it was spent inside the uh, precinct, uh, the GCPD headquarters, and I thought that... Uh, in the first episode, it, I, for some reason those scenes weren't really clicking so much for me. And then in this one, I really liked spending time in the GCPD building. Um, I thought it was hilarious that they would interrogate people in the open of everybody. Like they, at the beginning, they had they were interrogating the the the, kid, the homeless kid, and Bullock threatens to beat him with everybody walking by. And then later in the episode, they're literally in a holding cell, which is a few feet from Bullock's desk. 
and they're beating a guy with a phone book with officers walking by and not caring at all. I thought that was hilarious. They're just like, not even batting an eye, and he's beating the crap out of this guy with, with a phone book. Um, I thought that was so great and, and such a nice little touch. And um, just, oh, I, I, I like the atmosphere they're building of this completely corrupt city. In the first episode, it wasn't as humorous. Uh, it didn't have that playfulness that I felt like this episode had. And maybe that's maybe why I wasn't with it as much for the first episode was that it was taking itself a little too seriously. This episode I felt like had a bit more, you know, humor and tongue and cheekness going on, and, and I really liked that. I even liked how much uh, Barbara was actually like proactive in this episode. Like she only had one scene, and I liked her infinitely better than last week um, with the first episode. She had one scene, but I felt like it, it actually like she was pushing uh, like uh, Jim to to be more proactive, like, yeah, you can't do that because you're playing this game, but I'll play this game for you and do it. Um, and I liked how, uh, how she just, like, called in the, in the tip, and uh, I, it was a lot better than the first episode, um, interaction-wise, between them. Uh, so, first of all, um, I have never seen uh, uh, the Dan's Joker tattoo this close up, and that's amazing. Second of <laughs> all, uh, so... With let's not let's not get the Barbara thing out of the way really fast. Uh, I I I still I still didn't like her. Um, I I get, I get what you say. I wrote that down too. Yay, she's proactive. But after that, I wrote the word but because I'm like I feel like you've dated you're dating this cop. You've dated another cop before. I feel like you'd be smarter than making that phone call. Like 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 I, I get that you know you know it's the right thing. We shouldn't be covering this up. But. What kind of heat are you gonna put um, Gordon under? Like, she's gotta know dating cops that things just aren't that black and white, right? Like, even Gordon gets that things aren't that black and white, and I mean, he's the big idealistic, you know, you know, optimistic guy in the show. Yeah, um, and I, I like her back and forth a little bit with Gordon, where she's like, "It was the right thing to do," and Gordon's like, "That's not the point." She says, "What is the point?" Uh, that that's a good enough line, but. Uh, again, last episode they said that she's yeah. his fiance. She's not acting like a fiance. She's acting like this is a guy I've had a couple of dates with, and I'm just gonna do things. And they don't get each other yet. I guess I, I can, don't see yeah, any chemistry really, between really the that. two. Like, what does he see in her, and what does she see in him? Aside from the fact that they're both just really attractive. How like, much of that? Really about it. Yeah, man, and 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 we've seen this in plenty of other TV shows, right? I, okay, yeah. so how much of that is in the script, and how much of is it is it the acting? Because we've seen lots of uh, uh, shows and movies where where we like to praise uh, uh, actors who probably didn't know each other before for creating a relationship where they look like they know each other for years. They're not pulling that off. And again, I don't know if that's—I don't know if we should blame that more on the script or, or, or more on their acting or on the casting. Uh, the, the issue could even be less that, that I'm just not liking her as an actress and more that she wasn't right for the part with this Gordon. Um, this feels like it could be one of those things where they just picked the wrong duo. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, I don't think it's so much the writing because I can see another actress pulling off her lines. It's just. There's not a physical, but th there seems to be like this meta divide between these two people where they're not getting close enough to each other. They're not looking at each other the right way. Yeah. They don't feel like a couple, you know? They feel like they're still sizing each other up and figuring out where they'll stop the line for each other and what's too much for them. I, I don't see them as lasting as long as they supposedly have. Like, why Why are they getting married? Why did they move to Gotham? I. It's not even a backstory thing. It's just I can't look at them and tell that these two would be there for each other. Uh, I like what Dan said about the stuff in the precinct, uh, and, that, and that there's there's a, there's kind of more fun and comedy to be to be had here. Although I thought this show is so dark, it's relentless, <laughs> or at least that, that's 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 what I felt like, um, especially the first time watching it. Like uh, like yeah, there's some more stuff that is genuinely funny, but it's 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 very black humor stuff. And uh, I, again, I like that it's so heightened in comic book, but like. If if this is you know if this ends up being tame for the show being only the second episode for like for like, like how rough it gets with like the guy with the eyes gouged out and and uh, and and then and then and then her just kind of and and then like just just the, the general disregard for life that people have and uh, and, and and for children ah like 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 the whole time I just kept going ah. <laughs> They're not. I know they're not doing this on purpose, but it's it's so dark that it's absurd. 
Well, and maybe yeah. here's the thing though. I disagree with you. I think they might be doing that on purpose. I, I, I think they might be thinking that we can go this dark because we're doing some absurdist dark and some stylized dark. That that's how we get away with it on TV because this so much of of, of at least. The idea wise, thematically, this should be rated R stuff, man. And and, yeah. and like and like I, I think they might be thinking that well all we gotta do is have is have a, a Jada Ping Smith playing a, a, a fish go so over the top that you can't take it as seriously as you would otherwise. And so then we can do things like putting a bunch of kids on a bus and uh, and man, that line when she is when, when that when that when that creepy and he's right, very cartoon looking, that 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 uh, that, that creepy lady running uh, this this uh, kid smuggling ring um says we'll put a black mark on your forehead oh <laughs> man yeah uh, i mean you mentioned this scene where the guy had his eyes, eyes gouged out and then the woman just said no we'll just take you to a doctor and then shoots him in the head that's dark but it was so dark that it made me laugh i feel like this is this is so crazy it's funny and then the delivery when she when, when she goes when he goes what's that and she goes just hold on a minute and i was like <laughs> whoa like yeah it, it felt like i was watching like have you ever watched kiss kiss bang bang no i it, haven't I, okay, I yeah, well, it, is, it, it feels quite a bit like that film um, i believe that's shane black but yeah it feels quite a bit like that film where you're doing these things like removing people's thinkings or gouging out eyes and there's all this blood but the but the fact that they're doing it in the first place is just hysterical. Uh, I think that I, I also I, I, a little bit of what Dan was talking about in the in the precinct I, I, with with the kid getting beaten up on all of that. I think that's all really important that that uh, and especially the way the mayor is handling this and everything that that like. Um, we're looking for excuses to get to to put the kids away and not have to worry about them. We are not being adults with the way that we're dealing with our children, and we're blaming them at very young ages for all of these really horrible things that they're, there's there's that line of like um, so much of the petty crime that happens is from kids. Yeah, but whose fault is that? Really, you fostered this environment. Um, th this is uh, I, I'll mention this later again because uh, this is one of my favorite lines. But um, I think that when Bullock says we're grown-ups we're smarter than you that is really telling because they're not and then you see you know you know you know a cowman later um showing that she's I think she's smarter than Bullock in a lot of ways you know and, and, and but, yeah. but 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 like I think that's telling of not for Bullock but for, but but for the larger situation that the adults are not being adults they're actually really juvenile in the way that they're running their city and that that's why it's crumbled so much and you can't raise kids like that um I I'm I, by the way I'm liking this episode so much more right while, while we're talking about it yeah I agree because I was really down on it last night actually um yeah, I like that you mentioned that. Um, back when Rudy Giuliani was president of New York, or not president, I mean, president of New York. New York, yes. <laughs> back when he was president of New York, no. yes, he was. But back back when he was running New York, essentially, they had a, they had a pretty big homeless problem, and they just decided to take a bunch of kids and ship them to upstate facilities. Yeah, and that that got a lot of controversy, and he had a lot of flack for that. In Gotham, the mayor does it, and everyone's like, "Yeah, that's the sane, rational thing to do. Why would anyone argue against it?" And that's definitely really telling of how different this world is. Um, it, it definitely works with how these kids play their scenes. Like they don't, they're there in this dark, this terrible looking place with this with this hole in the ground that leads on forever. And they're, they're just sitting there all zoned out and not really fighting it. Yeah. They're, they're just used to how terrible this place is. And that's depressing. Yeah, really depressing. Um, and the fact yeah. that Bruce living in this beautiful home with all these nice clothes saying, what can I possibly do that these kids need? It, it's pretty emotional in some, re in some respects. It's almost like uh, people, including Alfred to a degree, are ex would, would probably expect, I don't want to read too much into this because we haven't had a lot of this yet, but it's almost like people in the city would expect Bruce, because he's privileged, even though his parents died, to be as detached and out of touch as everybody else is about that. You know, where, where, where it's, like, where it's like, well, you're, you're, you're privileged, you should just like take what you can get and appreciate where you are and ignore everything else. And, and, and th this, this whole episode is about everyone ignoring the problems and making them work. like like I, I think part of the problem is this mentality and I like that we're exploring so much of this uh, with with the city politics and stuff I feel like so much of the mentality is nobody's looking ahead nobody's looking three inches past their nose right everybody's it's 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 all right now what can I get for myself 
right now, and that's and, and that's and that's uh, that's Gordon on the pier, right? That's that that's what that's what they expect him to do to do to do there. Um, you know, you can't think of even if you were to like die for your beliefs, um. And you can't think about what that would do to help make the city better. You have to think about just you and just the moment right now. And what we're seeing are a couple of characters with 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 Gordon, with Bruce, and um, with Selena a little bit, probably a lot more later. Uh, uh, pe people actually looking ahead, uh, and yeah. and Penguin, and that's really important because Penguin's the the one who sees the the gang war coming. Yeah, yeah, it's fantastic. Um... Really quickly, I also want to mention how powerful this city is. Um, yeah. Yeah, it, it's not only shot really well, it's not only made really well, but every one of these characters are the way they are because they live in this city. And Bruce Wayne, living in Wayne Manor, out on the outskirts of the city, never interacting, only having one night out there that essentially ruined his life, and no matter how far away he gets from it, it's the only thing that he thinks about. Um, it's, it's a really strong city. And it's it's in all of these characters. All of these characters seem to make compromises very, very quickly. Gord at the very beginning of this episode says you can't beat someone, but near the end of the episode he has to do it anyway. It doesn't take long yeah. for the city to change your mind on things, and that's a, that's a little scary in some respects. Uh, Steve, I had every intention of moving the show faster uh, this year, but or in the, the discussion shows in general, uh, but I've just been enjoying talking to you about this so much that I've not been looking at the clock the way I should. I've only got 15 minutes before I've got to go on to another appointment, so uh, let's listen to uh, Dan's stuff that he doesn't like, uh, respond to that briefly, and then we'll go on to um, best moment, worst moment. Sure. I'd say the worst part about this episode, I don't really like this. I actually, I just liked it all the way around. I don't know if, um, if there was really anything that I really took to be a bad thing about the episode. Hmm. Hmm. I don't know if there's anything that I disliked about this episode. I like, I liked it all the way around. I'm sure if I was talking to you guys and I heard some of your guys' points, I would maybe agree with whatever point you bring up. But. <laughs> I'm not there, which makes me sad. <laughs> okay, well, let's go ahead then and go on to uh, best moment, worst moment. He gave us uh, his overall be uh, uh, favorite and not a least favorite thing at all. We'll go ahead and do moments ourselves. Uh, Steve, what was your favorite moment of the episode? Uh, favorite moment is, again, a Falcone scene. When Falcone's talking to Fish Mooney in the restaurant, yeah. uh, I love the, the dialogue in that scene. I love the acting in that scene. I love the whole power of that scene, and I know for a fact, I'm not for a fact, but I have this hunch that Falcone knows that Fish Mooney's lying. Oh, yes. And he's just playing it, and it's great. First time um, the only around. thing I would have about that scene is that when uh, Fish Mooney loses her cool, Falcone would still be in earshot. So yeah, I had the it's same a thing. That she would do that. I felt like there was supposed to be some time that passed, but I didn't get the sense that time passed. Um, the first time I watched it, uh, I even tweeted this while I was doing live tweets. I was like, uh, I, I, I'm not sure if Falcone is really somehow this naive and just this out of touch, and this is why he's going on the way out. Um, I watched that scene totally wrong last night because when I watched it again today, um, when when uh, when he has her boyfriend, not really boyfriend, uh, get pulled off and and get beat up by his thugs. He's making a huge point with that uh, to, to her. Um, he's saying, don't cross me. I know you're lying. He, and that's the reason she reacts the way she does. Um, he doesn't He doesn't come out and, and, and say to her, because this is how the strategy of this kind of like uneasy diplomacy works, right? Um, we've, we've seen this with uh, with like uh, Picard and Tomahawk over over uh, over uh, uh, comms over and over again in, 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 in TNG. Um, it's that kind of thing, where um, he says one thing, but it's the actions that matter. And so, and and, and so you've got um, you've got that that uh, that kid getting beat up in the back, and I, th I thought that everything that comes out of Falcone's mouth is fantastic. Yes, that that guy just knows how to read all the lines perfectly. It's like they get different people to write his dialogue specifically. Uh, I feel the same way as I did about like Lex Luthor and Smallville and, and Lionel. Um, although, let me say that this episode, I didn't have a lot of problem with the writing. I thought most of it was pretty good. Yeah, yeah. Um, the more we talk, the less problems I actually have with it overall. Uh. Men who aren't about to die are very honest. Yes. Uh, like, I, I, I like that a lot. Uh, and, and and he says that about Penguin. And then later on, uh, in order to kind of keep the peace, but also to make a point to her, uh, he says, "Oh well, that I, I guess I guess if you're telling me the truth, and that was just the ramblings of of a um, of a desperate man." Cle clearly, he doesn't believe that. Um, well, I also love the end of that line that you mentioned, where he says, "It pays to listen to them," it pays, because this yes. whole thing is a business. 
and he plays it so brutally well and at the end of it's just about who's lining their pockets and even asked her how good is she doing in her business right now another very telling line there was uh it's it's not my enemies it's my friends who keep me up yeah uh, my favorite moment, uh, I, 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 I agree with you, that one's wonderful. Uh, I don't know what it is with me right now, and, and I, I, like, it's so difficult watching the show because I, I'm enjoying things I shouldn't enjoy, and then other things are like really bothering me, and I'm like, oh, skin crawly, but then other things where I'm going, yeah, that's awesome, and then I go, I, oh my god, I feel like I'm watching lions eating Christians. <laughs> I, um, Penguin killing the guys in the truck. Yeah. Such a good scene. Real, I mean, like, and again, I get why people are, are, are complaining about the whole they're calling him a penguin thing and, and, and all of that, but, like, I, I'm really enjoying his insecurities, and yet he knows what he's capable of, and he knows what, and, 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 and like, he thinks he knows what he should be given because of what he can do, so there's this huge conflict there, and I feel like... Um, that's it's so incredible. Like, like, somebody who is that... I think I said this last week, but somebody who is that skilled... Excuse, Excuse me, and yet that um, insecure is the most dangerous person on the planet. Yeah, I mean, you saw his kill board, essentially, where he's mapping out all yeah. the conspiracies and stuff. He's got some of the best vocabulary in the whole show. Yes, he does. And, and, I, and, I, and I commented on his vernacular last week. I thought this week it was even better. Um, yeah, good yeah. stuff. Uh, worst moment? Oh, uh, worst moment? It, it's not really so much of a moment. It was just an ongoing thing, but we mentioned this earlier. I hate that Selena's insisting on being called the cat. Oh, you don't like... Uh, see, I'm fine with it. it. I think it's really annoying. Um, uh, for one, when a cat woman shows up, we all know it's Selena Kyle. And secondly, it's just kind of annoying. Like, why do you want to be called the cat? What is your thing with cats? I guess... It, my, my thing with the whole everybody's going to know who people are. Obviously, Gordon is going to be so instrumental in Bruce Wayne becoming Batman, he's going to know he's Batman. I, I think we just got to see how it plays out. If we never get to see that stuff... Maybe all the better. Uh, when we do get there, if we get there, the, the, I, for me, the question is, are secret identities going to be a thing in this show? If it's so much of a reimagining, is it possible that we don't have to worry about that? That, that we're not, not going to have the issue of people pretending to, or like the show having to uh, like, like contrive reasons for people to, for mistaken identities to work. I, I like, I feel, I, I'm hoping it's smarter than that. Um, because this episode I thought was a lot smarter than the, than, than the first, and, and I may, it might be showing us that it is smarter than that. Um, yeah, yeah, hopefully so. I, I mean, all I'm saying is, if it is, that route, but... if it is smarter than that, and this is not a prequel, but simply the story starts here, I can't have any problem with she's already called the cat. Yeah, I mean, it's not so much that it, that they're gonna know that she's Catwoman as maybe as much as she's looking for her mom. She's got an attempt. She's got this clinging to family. Her name is Selena Kyle. Why does she want to be called Cat? Does it just sound cool, or does she have a problem with her given name, or like there's a story there? And when, until we get that story, it just feels like a weird teen quirk of, I hate my name that my parents gave me, let me get something See, that's not how I read it. I read it more as she doesn't want anybody who doesn't already know to know her identity. That she's trying to keep, like, like she's trying to, to create a new identity, and she's trying to keep her identity. I, I, it's almost as if it's sacred to her. I think it's the opposite of what you're talking about. I, 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 think, it's, I think it's not that she's ashamed of it. I think, it's, I think it's sacred to her. She's trying to keep it a secret for some reason. She doesn't want anybody to know about it. That's why when Gordon... Um, um, I, I ask her her name she immediately says why is that any of your business she doesn't immediately go oh the cat or or act like oh I'm ashamed it's why is that your business um, it is too intimate for me for some reason to let people know that about myself and that is classic Catwoman um, yeah I guess I can go with that so I, I, we'll just have to see I mean we're kind of talking about a thing that we don't know enough about yet right <laughs> um, my, my worst moment uh, at, the, at the time was was Barbara calling the newspaper. I, I still don't like that. I, I feel like she'd be she'd be a little smarter than that. I get why she does it, and yes, proactive. But it just it just seemed like that was kind of like dating a cop one hundred and one. You don't you don't tell anybody. They like, like trust him. You know, he knows what he's doing. Yeah. Um, I, at the same time, I like the idea that we could get the Gotham Gazette in, and, and that's going to be instrumental in removing the corrupt authority. But the but the fact that she does it so quickly, like immediately she just gets up and calls the phone, and um, they answer and she hangs up. It's just it's too quick. There's no there's not enough good acting in that whole scene, and it just feels like those two people don't know each other very well. How could she think that Gordon wouldn't be upset about that? She she calls up and the person who answers is someone named Bobby Vale or something. <laughs> 
Okay, uh, let's listen to Dan's favorite line. As far as favorite lines, um, I actually do have favorite lines this week. I even have them printed out. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, I didn't have one favorite line. I had two favorite lines. One's a funny line, and the other's like a serious line that I thought was really, really good. So the line I really liked was from the police chief lady, who I can't remember her name, but you guys know who she is because you're smarter than I am. But um, <laughs> Uh, the, the line she said where she says, it's not like, it, talking to Gordon, it's not like it can order you to break the law, but if you don't bend, you get broke. Yeah. Um, and I really liked that. That was so, like, I liked how, first of all, she was like, I can't order you to break the law, <laughs> but you should. You're running you the should. police you station! Should. That's, that's, like, so indicative of, of Gotham and everything, the corruption. And I really, I really liked that. Um, I just like that line, just because it's weird coming out of a police chief, just like, you probably should break the law, but uh, also, you, know, the whole, you don't get, you don't bend, you get broke, um, and so it, it, it's clear that Jim, on top of the questionable decisions he's already had to make, um, he's going to have plenty ahead that he's going to have to deal with, um, and I think that'll be interesting to see how what kind of toll it takes on him over time because uh, it it really feels like that there will probably be a breaking point at some point. There has to be a point where he's going to lose just all faith at this point. Not at this point, but later on, um, you could only take so much corruption and getting kicked, you know, while you're down constantly for him. Um, he's trying to do something good, but I think eventually, especially when you have to pretend like you're part of the system, really like weigh on him the, the things he has to do or the things that he has to let happen um, when even knowing he knows it's not right. Like in this episode, like particularly already. Um, he knew it's the right thing to, to call in the tip to the newspaper about the children being abducted, but at the same time, he was still trying to play the game and uh, you know deal with it internally like the GCP wants, but at the same time, that's still not right. So I like that uh, Barbara pushed him, or well, you know, essentially did it for him, uh, did the right thing. So it, it seems like down the road, I bet there's gonna be more and more things that are just completely more morally ambiguous or just straight up wrong that he'll have to do in order to maintain the position he's in. The other line, and this is a this is a funny line that I really liked, and I, it might be one of your guys' lines too, uh, I, I bet Cap liked this line, but when, he, when uh, Bullock and, and Gordon were talking about just uh, Barbara and Gordon's relationship, and they were talking about, you know, how they were together and stuff like that. Monkey Gordon riding died. a racehorse? And Bullock says to Gordon, you, my friend, are a monkey riding yes! a racehorse. Yes! Monkey a riding a racehorse! Um, one, just the, the imagery of that. A monkey yeah. riding a racehorse, but on top of that, it was just a funny line. I like that. That's like, shiny shoes, my god, or my god, shiny shoes. I don't know. <laughs> shiny but shoes, I, I, mother like of Bullock's god! It's some really good one-liners every once in a while, so I'm excited about that. That and the, the one he said, how now is so righteous. Like, I thought that was funny. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, so those are my favorite lines. We need to add a segment uh, uh, in the in the show of of, of like of like uh, quotable bullock lines. You know, just like just like just like the the, the the moment where he says that thing. Yeah, I had it down to monkey riding a racehorse. Uh, I I really feel I really wonder if every episode I'm not gonna have something like this. Really, like, I'm 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 loving his dialogue. Um, Right. What was your favorite line, Steve? Uh, okay, um, my favorite line. I did really like the, the one um, Dan mentioned about. Um, I can't order you to break the law, yeah. but um, uh, but you, if you don't bend, then you get broke. But then I also like the line that we mentioned earlier about men who are about to die are very honest. It pays to listen to them. Um, we already kind of talked about the ideas back and forth about that line. Yeah, but it it's just completed so well, especially when he says it pays to listen to them. Um, and the way the actor just utters those words, there's so much conviction to it. There's so much behind his eyes when he's wording it out. I think it's a great scene. He really commands the screen. He does. Uh, I was surprised by how quotable this one was. Uh, I had a number of, of, of lines. Uh, my my uh, my very favorite was um, was the one I mentioned earlier. Uh, we're grown ups. We're smarter than you. I just think that 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 is that is a really important line for the whole episode. That encapsulates the the mentality of the whole city. Um, you're not a bad guy, just a bad cop. Uh, I think that's a, that's a that, that's a that's a thing that Gordon could probably say to a lot of different people. Um, and I like that too because it's indicative of uh, like 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 I like that he's. Uh, objective and smart enough to, to know that like um 
the best of people can be corrupted, can 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 be ruined by this city. Um, that guy, if he was operating in like Atlanta or something, probably wouldn't be like this. Uh, so so yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, I like that a lot, a lot too. Um, the the mayor's line, the loving arms of juvenile services. What an oxymoron! <laughs> That was great. Uh, and oh, then, that's fantastic. And then, of course, monkey riding a racehorse. Uh, all right, so uh, let's go on now to predictions, and uh, let's hear some predictions from Dan. My predictions slash hopes uh, for the, uh, you know, continuing on series, I'd really like to see Gordon hit a low um, because, you know, you can't be perfect all the time, especially when you're kind of going against the corruption you're consistently working with the corruption that you're trying to prevent, uh, you know, being such an altruistic guy whose, you know, main focus is to do the right thing. Um, I, I'd really like to see kind of a breaking point for him, and I'm sure it will come. I, there's no way it's not building to that eventually. Um, not that, the, like, it, he's starting to crack at this point, but I, he's going to have to at some point. There has yeah. to be a point where he just snaps. Um, you know, I'm just, and Cap will probably get this, like, it's just like, the uh, in Voyager at the point where Janeway kind of just got completely, oh, Star Trek completely the show. became a shut in and and stopped essentially captaining the ship just because she felt she had failed everyone and how can she face these people who she failed um, and so I feel like nice. it's going to be that thing where he feels like he can't do he can't do it anymore he can't keep fighting the system that just keeps changing and getting more and more corrupt and just just degrading beneath him. So I, I feel like there will probably be a breaking point at some point for him. Um, I, I think that would be interesting to see. Um, don't know when it'll happen, but I, I can almost, I feel like it's going to happen. I don't know if you guys agree with that, but I, it would definitely be interesting to see. So that's kind of my, my prediction slash hope because I, I feel like, I definitely feel like that's going to happen. And it would be, it would be very cool to see. I think I just said the same thing about eight times. <laughs> I think that will come from uh, Montoya and her partner um, honing in on him, uh, thinking that he actually killed the penguin. Um, I think when he finally has to face that down, and they were really setting that apart here. Um, I hope that doesn't take too long. But uh, but when they when they when he finally has to face down um, the the good cops that are that that are holding people accountable for the things that Essen says go do the wrong thing. Um, <laughs> I think that's when that's when that happens. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, it actually sort of wraps into my prediction, which is. I, I hope this show eventually goes to like a Noyar route of not style wise, but just thematically wise, where Noyar is fatalistic storytelling, where the the char the main characters, whatever the hero is, they can only get a small win and realize the system is always going to get to them. Yeah. And if Gordon gets to a low point, I hope the show eventually becomes that Gordon's going to take his victories where they can get it, but he knows he's never going to win the war. Um, that'd be a really depressing show, but I think it'd be interesting. Uh, got a couple of things. Uh, once again, why, why, if this is the case, why do uh, Oswald and his mother have different last names that are sort of the same? I don't, I don't understand that. Um, are we gonna get a Ben Edlin script in this show? He's one of the executive producers. I is he didn't really? know that. His name is in the is in the episode. I didn't catch it till the second time. But yeah, he's one of the co-producers. Um, oh, oh, that's exciting. Wow. I mean, I, I was just thinking like Angel Smile Time or something, but no, it, I didn't think I was a producer. Wow. I'm So I'm hoping we get an Edlin script because usually if he's producing, he writes a little bit. Wow. Okay. So, yeah. That, that, awesome. uh, if you don't know who Ben Edlin is, uh, he created The Tick, and of course uh, he he was uh, one of the, the the prominent showrunners of Supernatural, which I didn't watch. Uh, but um, and and he worked on Angel. Uh, I am a huge Ben Edlin fan. The Tick is my my favorite superhero next to Batman. And um, yay for Ben Edlin working on this show. Uh, that is really interesting. Um, how long will both Fish and Falcone or Falcone live? Uh, I I I. I Somebody uh, uh, sent me a tweet last night and said that they thought that responding to, to something I said, um, that thought that uh, that that probably um, Fish would take over for Falcone and then she'd probably get killed by the Penguin or something. Uh, I think that's likely. I don't know how long it'll take, uh, but I don't think Falcone makes it through this just because he's a character we've heard of. I think he gets killed in the next season or two. Um, I certainly hope not because he's, he's great. so interesting. 
But this whole like 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 holding on to the system with a thread and all that, I yeah, I I really I really kind of don't think he'll make it. Um, those are mine. Uh, let's go ahead and go on now to trivia questions. Uh, d uh, what was your trivia question for the week, sir? Uh, do you want me to answer the last week too? Oh yes, of course. Uh, <laughs> I'll, you know what? Also, um, I said I would uh, read people's answers. Uh, yes, yeah, so I have it right here. Okay, so last time, uh, what was your question and what was the uh, what was the, the answer? All right, last week my question was because Detective Allen is in this show, and everyone wanted this show to be Gotham Central. Who kills Detective Allen in the comics? The answer is Jim Corrigan, the Spectre, um, the post-crisis Spectre that was reinvented by Greg Rucka and Ed Brubaker for that series. And the first person who got that right was Eli McCraig, so I, uh, or, or McCaig. Okay, I didn't put an R in here, so I either left it out or your name is McCaig. Anyway, um, congratulations to you. You got the question right this week. Uh, and as always, uh, for our questions for this week, if you think you know the answers, don't put them in the comments. I mean, you can, but we won't we won't look at them. I, I send them to me as a personal message on Geekvolution, or I uh, send them as uh, a message on Geekvolution.com in the contact section. Uh, my question last time, of course, uh, we went ahead and gave the answer already in the show because you revealed it on accident. <laughs> so um, I'll go ahead and give go ahead and give your your question for this week. Uh, as always, something uh, uh, Batman peripheral. Go ahead. Okay, um, when Selena Kyle has a daughter following the one year later storyline, she gives her up, she gives up being Catwoman and takes out a new name to raise her. What name does she pick? That's a good one. If, if you know it, uh, send it to me on geekvolution.com or as a personal message. Uh, as always, I'm going to uh, pick one from the episode. Uh, we see a sign that uh, was a little bit reminiscent of 60s Batman. And uh, but I, I'm, I, I the, the number was different. Uh, there is a there is a sign that we see um, while Penguin is walking along the road waiting for someone to pick him up, and it's a Gotham this far away sign. How many miles away was Gotham from where Penguin was when he got picked up by that truck? Oh, that's awesome. That's the that's the question. Uh, all right, let's go ahead and listen to Dan's final thoughts. So yeah, once again, thank you guys. Thank you guys for uh, you know having video me in here. Um, <laughs> sorry I couldn't be there. I will be back next week. And yeah, bye. All right, cool. Well, that was really neat of Dan to do that, uh, so that so that uh, we got to respond to him, and uh, it, it felt like he was here. That was that that, that was that was absolutely wonderful. <laughs> uh, Steve, thanks for joining me, man. I had a great time as always. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me. This was a super long show. Again, I'm kind of hoping these don't always clock in an hour, but I felt like this was a dense one. There was a lot to talk about. Just stop making good episodes, and we won't have to worry about it. Yeah, right? yeah, exactly. Well, anyway, I uh, hope you guys enjoyed it. Looking forward to reading your comments. Uh, I'm sure lots of folks didn't enjoy it as much as we did. And like I said, I didn't like it as much until we started talking about it. Yeah, same. So, I was getting ready to really rip into it, but no, I, I guess most of it makes sense. Thanks so much for watching. Sure appreciate you. I am Captain Logan. And I'm Steve Baxi. And uh, for Dan's news, uh, this is Geek Thanks a lot for watching. <laughs>